Have you ever looked into the Great Depression here in America? Have you ever looked into any of that? Into the history of it? How it happened? The banks and whatnot? Suddenly there was no money or their money wasn't available? And during the Great Depression, um, you read stories and accounts of men, people just, just launching themselves out of buildings and killing themselves because they had lost everything lost all their worldly possessions. And not only just losing all their worldly possessions, but also losing some of the, uh, with some of them, also losing their soul. Why? Because if they weren't saved, then they decide to jump out of a window because everything that was of the world, that was their life, they lost. Hmm. Hmm. It appears. That when man, and that means mankind, okay, that when man is brought to what they perceive to be the end of everything, that even the world will do what the world calls foolish. And the world calls foolish going on to, as what? The invisible guy in the sky who's keeping track of everything you do and is going to send you to hell where you're going to burn forever and ever and ever if you don't do it his way. But he loves you. The argument of the atheist, of course. Of course. And of course, we have the Church of the Living God. We realize and we know and we preach and teach. Uh, if you reject Jesus Christ, God's love is not for you. Yes, God is going to send you to the place prepared for the devil and his angels. If you do not repent and come to him on his terms. Yes, yes. But you got to remember, if you reject the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, the good news, Christ and him crucified, God's love is not for you. You are a child of wrath. You are a child of disobedience. You're going to hell. You're going to hell. And I am one that truly believes with the psychological operation of the poison crown, which the Jesuit order clearly instituted, clearly created, that they put upon the world from all the way on to 2019, on to present, that the Jesuit order with their operation, the poison crown, pushed this thing that they created, this sickness, which I believe, and from the beginning I have always said this, that it is a biological man-made weapon. The thing that people are getting sick from today is not something that is derived of a natural means. Um, God allowed it. God is allowing it, yes. But it is not of natural means. It was made in a laboratory by men, by Jesuits. Okay? And what was their, what was their answer to this? Everybody needed to roll up and take the steel of the Jesuit poniard, okay? And the truth of the matter is, okay, and many people don't want to believe this because they want to believe the Jesuit-controlled government and here in America, the Jesuit Catholic disease creators, okay? They want to, they are trusting in men more than they are in God. The evidence is clear that what, the, what they put in the steel of the Jesuit poniard, okay, is toxic. And while not everybody has fallen over, croaked, or died, but the side effects have been prolific. And I truly believe that within the next couple of years, we are going to see the after effect of the push of the steel of the Jesuit Punyard. Why? For one reason, I believe, for population control. Because you got to remember the evolutionary mindset that these Jesuits put this whole operation into being in, okay? And the less people on the earth, the less people that that man of sin, the son of perdition, has to worry about. And also, uh, another thing that got brought up, which I think is also valid, um, that it could cause some to go sterile, even though you hear of these um, plandemic babies with the creepy black eyes and stuff like that. Okay, and the Jesuit controlled media. Oh, dear friends, there are media sources out there 
um, that you can look to. Um, there are. There are alternative medias. Stay away from Alex Jones. Stay away from him. Okay, please. But that, like the Freedom Articles, there are ones like that. Um, guys like uh, um, Now the End Begins and Wine Press, I don't recommend them. I don't. Um, because they're both uh, proud, arrogant liars. Okay. But uh, even then, both those two guys who are arrogant, stuck-up liars, both of them, even they both give credible good news cannot detract that away from them, even though that they both are stuck up, arrogant, I believe, lost people, okay? But the information that they put forth is good. So there is information. There are other news sources out there that you can locate because, it, brethren, if you watch the news, it is so controlled. It is so obvious. They're working off of the same script. They are working for the Jesuit order. They are controlled by the Jesuits. And how convenient in the media, even though, even though COVID, as they say, the psychological operation known as Poison Crown, it's still there lingering as an option. But now, of course, look what's happening in America. Okay, look what's happening in the world. Ukraine and Russia with Putin, okay? Distraction. Here in America, this morning today, as I found out, my wife had some stuff she had to go do today, this morning. She took care of it, and she's like, you know, at some gas stations here in Illinois, um, gas is now $5.15 per gallon, okay? The prices of food, the prices, the overall cost of living is rising, okay? It's rising. And of course, the Jesuit uh, Federal Reserve Bank said they're doing something with the interest rate, which isn't going to affect anything. If anything, it's going to make things worse, okay? And there, there are those out there who's like, well, you know, 10 years ago when gas rose up to $3 and something, people thought, oh, wow. Well. Yes, and that, that's a valid argument. But see, the cost of living here in America, I can't speak for other nations. Here in America, the cost of living is rising and the quality of life is dropping. Okay? Okay? You got prices raising and quality of life deteriorating. Okay? Things are not getting better. And like I said, in the background, this looming poison crown operation that the Jesuits instituted, when you have the black pope himself saying, we can't go back to the way it was, you need to take heed to that. When um, the servant, when the devil's main servant, the black pope, the head of Catholicism, the head of the Jesuit order, when he says something like that, you got to be like, oh, wow. Okay. And hence the point. I believe within the next couple of years, three, maybe four, we are going to be seeing the after effect of the Jesuitical push to get the steel of the Jesuit poniard out there and infect as many people as they can with that which they call good, which is actually evil. And when the economies col collapse and when the greatest depression becomes... People are going to be losing things. When people start dying, when everything that the world tells everybody that is important, okay? The scriptures tell us having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But the world says you got to have a big house, you got to have a car, you got to have a trophy wife or a trophy husband, okay? You got to have umpteen pen, pets uh, to be in debt. It's the American way. And when this whole thing starts collapsing. People are going to be brought to an end of themselves. But for what? And when people are brought to the end of themselves, those who before scoffed at the, what is it? The invisible guy in the sky keeping track, okay? When 
these people are brought to their worst, they will consider what they consider foolish going to the Lord. Okay? And there are those of us of the Church of the Living God will be like, well, yay! Yay! At least we're getting the gospel out. At least they're seeking. Yes! Amen! <laughs> but, brethren, there is something that we have to consider, hence the point of this video. There is something that you and I have to consider, brethren. Turn, please get your, oh, sorry for that 10 minutes of ranting. Please get your authorized version of the scriptures and turn with me in your authorized version of the scriptures. Follow me along, word for word, verse by verse. Keep an eye on me. Check me out. Okay? Make sure I'm not skipping a groove. Make sure I'm telling you the truth. Follow me along. Okay? Get the scriptures out of the box, off the shelf, you complacent, lazy individual. Okay? All right? Get the scriptures. If you can't, fine. Pay attention and Lord, lead me, guide me. Okay? Okay? This isn't, this is serious. We need to consider something. Matthew chapter 13. Just two verses to start. Matthew chapter 13. Now remember, dispensationally, this is before the death, burial, and resurrection. This is about the, the, the parable of the sower and the seeds. Okay? I want us to concentrate on one aspect. Matthew chapter 13, verses 20 on to verse 21. But he that receiveth the seed into stony places, stony places, stone, not a rock, not a rock, a stone, a stone, a stone is not a rock, okay, okay, stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and Anon, we'll, we'll see what that means shortly, with joy receiveth it. So, when these people, when people start dying, when their loved ones start dying, and it, the cost of living, like in the Weimar Republic, gets so outrageously ridiculous, people are going to be brought to the lowest state. And they're going to look for something bigger than themselves. Hence, along comes Catholicism with all her whorish daughters. God loves you. Just believe. See, it's in these times, you disgusting, easy believism heretics with your self-righteous, I am saved because I believe. This is going to be prime time for you to come in and deceive these poor people. And hence, we... Brethren, Church of God, the Church of the Living God, which is the ground and pillar of truth. We need to be on our guard. We need to be on our A game, as it is said. When people start dying. When the, the cost of living gets too great. These people are going to look for what they hadn't before considered. And the devil and his church, Roman Catholicism, and all her daughters... Come around with their easy believism, the ecumenical pond scum gospel, or the satanic heresy of Calvinism, the three C's. They're going to deceive people and make them twofold uh, more the child of hell than them themselves. But these people, the seed will be sown on stony ground. Verse 21, yet hath he no root in himself. See, the stone, it just fell on the stone, and it grew that way. But it didn't penetrate that stone. You know when Jesus said to Lazarus, come forth, remove the stones, a stony heart. And that stony heart is no worse, is the, at its worst, I should say, in these Christians, these church-building Christians, okay, who are saved because they have just believed without any repentance, contrition, or fear of the Lord calling on his, upon his name, or they call upon his name, but without 
repentance or contrition or without fear of the Lord. Okay, there are several out there. It's like, well, I called on the name of the Lord. Yeah, but you're a devil. You're a devil. There's no contrition. Okay, they're sorry. But they're sorry that they got caught. Verse 21, yet hath he no root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, you know what you do with that? Like uh, our brother has said, and like I say, you know, it says the word, take your little pen, underline or circle the word. <clears throat> Going to be persecuted for being a Christian, huh? There are millions of Christians out there. It's for the word, for the word, the word. And that's the written word, not a capital W word, meaning the Lord himself, okay? By and by, he is offended. Let's read that again, because I broke the flow there. Yet hath he no root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by, that's what anon means in verse 20, okay? And by and by with joy receiveth it. Anon. It doesn't mean anonymously, okay? It means by and by. Comparing scripture with scripture. Do you see that? Don't look at me. Look at the book, okay? By and by he is offended. And what happens? As a dog returns to their vomit. That's why you see these guys, well, I was a Christian. Oh, but then you find out that the Lord has a specific way he wants those who are his to live. It's not according to your feelings. Not according to what to the, those in those disgusting buildings tell you. Not to what some of these online here tell you. Okay? But see, a lot of these people, when they lose things, like I said, they're going to come and consider what they hadn't considered before. And I know lots of criminals. You know, the courthouse is literally a couple of blocks down that way. You will see criminals have a type of repentance, but they're not sorry because they had offended against the individual for their crime. No, they're sorry for that they got caught. Their sorrow is that they got caught. They are sorry that they got caught because they got behind the wheel of a car, killed a husband and a father, and shows no remorse or repentance for doing so, but rather is upset because he's got to go to jail. Then he lies about it and gets out earlier, then gets in a drunken stupor, and then goes bludgeon someone half to death with a baseball bat. And yet, there again, is sorry that he got caught, not sorry that he did the deed unto the individual. Those brethren, those brethren, those are the types of people. They're going to be sorry that they lost everything. They're going to be sorry that their mother, their father, their grandfather died. Yes, dearly, dearly beloved, yes. Yes, they're going to be sorry for that. But we have to consider, are they truly broken? Because right here, now let's look at a variation of this. Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Okay, verses 16 and 17. Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Verses 16 and 17. Okay? We need to consider this because when all hell starts breaking loose, okay, you got these satanic devils going to come in with, the, it's a revival coming. Prosperity is coming now. That, that's nonsense. Dude, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Okay? Yes, people are going to start dying. People are going to start losing everything. Hence a, hence a prosperity and a revival is coming. God loves you. Just believe. Now is the time to come. Yes, now is the time. But are they coming truly because they are grieved for what they... I put Christ on the cross. It was my sin that caused him to die. It was my fault. And I was sorry. I am sorry that he died because of what I did. I'm sorry for what I did to Christ. 
and anyone who is truly saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, you have that sorrow because it's your fault that Christ died. You don't, well, it's this person. Well, it's, that's, a, that's a mark of a false convert. It's my fault. I put him there. He died because of what I did. I am sorry for what I did to Christ. But see, these people are going to be sorry that they've lost everything. And then, here comes the fall. Here comes the satanic Jesuit coadjutor with their easy believism gospel. Whether it's easy believism or simply utter some words like a robot without repentance, contrition, or fear of the Lord. Okay? They're going to sweep in and cause a mass, yeah, maybe even a prosperity and a revival. Maybe. But of those that are false because, as our Lord does in the scriptures, he puts his, he puts his finger right on that problem. Way back when, in yesteryears, there were people during the uh, camp meetings and the circuit preachers would go to certain preachers and they would be weeping and whatnot. And there's some preachers back then, it's like, you're not broken enough. I've lost everything. Wait, you're not broken enough. You're only sad and broken over what your worldly possessions have gone away. You're sad because of your state, not because of what you have done to the one who died for you. And in death, when a loved one dies, even then people are really, because they want to know that their loved one is in heaven. And then you then comes along the easy believism devil or the ecumenical pond scum and say, well, if they believed in Jesus, don't worry, he's in heaven. I exclude the Calvinists because Calvinists are arrogant and elect and non-elect. And uh, they bring up, well, we don't know if he was elect or non-elect. And remember, Calvinists teach works. Okay? They teach works. All right? Hence, you clean up your own life before the Lord saves you. Okay? But Mark chapter 4, verses 16 on verse 17. <laughs> 16, uh, not chapter 3. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. Yeah, at their broken state, because they lost all their worldly things, and their loved ones, yes they are, they're willing to accept what before they saw, it as, saw it as foolish. And have no root in themselves. They're willing to believe it for a while, so long as it makes them feel good. And so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for thee. Words sake. Immediately, they are offended. What do you mean God doesn't want me to watch TV? What do you mean I can't go to a football game or watch football? What do you mean I can't listen to a, a third day? What do you mean I can't listen to that disgusting Smith guy? What do you mean I shouldn't go to a church building? What, what, what do you mean? What do you mean? That's a, that's a God I don't want any part with. That's the God of the Scripture. We have to be aware of this, brethren. These people, just like the analogy of the criminal. I have seen, I have met, I have counseled, I have talked with prisoners. They're sorry that they got caught. If I hadn't gotten caught, I would have kept doing it. What about the people? Oh, I'm sorry about that. But, you know, they're more sorry that they're sitting in jail or that they got caught and they're brand with that stigma. Are you sorry for what you did to the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you sorry that you made that woman a widow and her children fatherless? You show it in what you do on YouTube, you scumbag. 
Yeah. They're sorry that they got caught. They're not sorry for what they've done to the Lord. Hosea, chapter 5. Hosea, chapter 5. Brad, you were angry. You, you're right. I'm angry. I'm angry. This, someone who comes to the Lord in that position without true repentance or contrition or fear of the Lord, but is willing to believe in all the good stuff that the Lord offers, but there's no repentance turning from self unto God. There is no contrition, godly sorrow. Godly sorrow. You sinned against God. You put God on the cross. But worldly sorrow, I've lost everything. Okay? We're going to address that. Those are the types of people, brethren, that we are going to be encountering here in the years to come. We need to be aware of this. And we need to be on guard. Me. Me. I need to be on guard too. You know why? I'm gullible. I'm gullible. I give people chances who I should never give chances. Okay? I am willing to trust people who should never be trusted. I am gullible. And it has bit me in the rear end one too many times that I don't like to acknowledge but must. We have to be aware of these things, brethren. We don't want to turn away someone who is legitimately broken, who has contrition and fear of the Lord. We don't want to be one of those. We don't want to be so hard that we turn away from the genuine article. But we have to be aware that there are so many false out there that they override the genuine article. These are the times that we live in. Like it is spoken of in what? What is it? First uh, Timothy or Second Timothy chapter 3? About this know also that perilous times shall come. I think that's Second Timothy chapter 3. Okay? We know this. We have to be aware of this. Like I said, my problem, my fault is I'm too gullible. I'm willing to trust people that should never be trusted. I give people chances that should never be given a chance. And it's bit me in the backside one too many times. I hate it. But Hosea chapter 5, verse 15. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. You might like to say, Amen, Amen, praise the Lord, Brad. Yes, when the afflictions come, yes, they'll seek the Lord early. Yes, they will. They'll be willing to give the Lord a chance. Now let's read the context of this. Let's read from verse 1 on to verse 15. Can you handle this? Now get a load of the context of when our Lord says this. Number one, we have to consider dispensationally, this was under the law. This was a different dispensation. We're looking at this for our instruction in righteousness. Okay? Instruction in righteousness to prepare us for what is coming. Okay? Doctrine is how we are saved within the current dispensation. That's the difference between the two. There are some of you out there that purposely blur that line. Okay? Okay? So, hear ye this, O priests. And hearken ye house of Israel, and give ye ear, O house of the king. For judgment is toward you, because ye have been a snare on Mizpah, and a net spread upon Tabor. And the revolters are profound to make slaughter. Oh yeah. Though I have been a rebuker of them all, these revolters are profound to make a slaughter. When these people are broken and at their wit's end, these heretics, these scumbag devils are going to come along with their easy believism doctrine or their ecumenical doctrine and deceive many and lead them to a slaughter. Okay? And make them twofold more the child of hell than they, than they themselves. And while the church of God is in such an uproar over a satanic hell a day, okay, <laughs> How few of us of the church of God are going to be willing, who are going to be out there when this is happening, but no, bickering over a satanic holiday. 
Oh, it's a liberty. You don't know what liberty is. Shut up. You have no concept. You're only using, using it to justify yourself. I know Ephraim and Israel is not hid from me. For now, O Ephraim, thou committest whoredom, and Israel is defiled. Note the difference between Ephraim and Israel. Some like to talk about when Ephraim is being mentioned that he it's always about Israel in this book. And in context, yes. But right there, there's distinction between Ephraim and Israel. Just so you know, okay? O Ephraim, thou committest whoredom, and Israel is defiled. They will not frame their doings to turn unto their God. Why is it? And, and this is true. Because of the Garden of Eden. Because man is born in sin. We're born sinners. Because of the Garden of Eden. Do what God, go against what God has said, and your eyes will be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Hence, we're all born sinners. And hence, man, the natural man, does not seek for God, but God has to allow horrible things to happen. I wish it wasn't so. But it is so. That man has to be brought to the end of himself, broken, in order to seek God in prosperity. If someone comes to the Lord, claims to come to the Lord when everything is just hunky-dory, I doubt someone, such a one is saved. I really do. I really do. I really do. You and I, as the church of God, we cannot physically experience the death on the cross yet. <laughs> that those times may be coming. But that brokenness, that despair, is the closest that some of us will come. And if that is not there in someone who is supposedly of the church of the living God, or even worse, a Christian, uh, I doubt they're saved. I really do. I really do. Yes, yes. They will not frame their doings to turn unto their God. For the spirit of whoredoms is in the midst of them, and they have not known the Lord. And the pride of Israel doth testify to his face. Therefore shall Israel and Ephraim fall in their iniquity. Judah also shall fall with them. They shall go with their flocks and with their herds to seek the Lord, but they shall not find him. He hath withdrawn himself from them. Why? Why is that? They have dealt treacherously against the Lord, for they have begotten strange children. Now shall a month devour them with their portions. Blow ye the cornet in Gebeah, and the trumpet in Ramah. Cry aloud at beth -Aven. after thee, O Benjamin. Ephraim shall be desolate in the day of rebuke. Among the tribes of Israel have I made known that which shall surely be. God's salvation is there to be had. You have to go to him on his terms. And the brokenness that you are feeling for losing all things and loved ones, it's not a true, it's a brokenness. Yes, it is a doorway. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not speaking against that. Okay. Yes, that is when someone is susceptible to the gospel. Yes, but we have to be on our guard that that person is truly broken and sorry for what he did to the Lord. Not just merely sorry that they got caught. See, see, in time. Endure it for a while, like we looked at, time will tell. Time will tell. Unless you know the Lord appears to you personally and speaking to you audibly. But go away. Glad you're gone. Okay? Blow ye the cornet in Gebeah, and the trumpet in Ramah. Cry aloud at beth -Aven. after thee, O Benjamin. For I am shall be desolate in the day of rebuke. Among the tribes of Israel have I made known that which shall surely be. The princes of Judah were like them that removed the bound. Therefore will I pour out my wrath upon them like water. For I am as oppressed and broken in judgment, because he willingly walked after the commandments. See, he's broken in judgment. Okay? These people will, will be broken in their judgment. God's judgment. But they, are they merely broken for what they're experiencing again? Or are they broken because you put the Lord on the cross. He died because of what you did. It's your fault. It's my fault. That's the difference. 
and time will tell. Many will say, yeah, it's my fault, but in time ye shall know them by their fruits. Therefore will I be unto Ephraim as a moth, and to the house of Judah as rottenness. When Ephraim saw his sickness, and Judah saw his wound, then went Ephraim to the Assyrian, and sent to King Jerob. Yet could he not heal you, nor cure you of your wound. They went to the Assyrian or Jerob, not the Lord. Hence, these satanic ministers with their satanic, easily believism gospel and the ecumenical thing, they're going to swoop in under the name of Christian and make many false converts sheep for the slaughter, or goats for the slaughter. You watch. That's going to happen, I believe, profoundly in a type when the Jesuits bring back Trump for his Napoleon appearance. You watch. You watch. You watch. Okay? For I will be on to Ephraim as a lion and a young lion in the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away. I will take away and none shall rescue him. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. Now, in context, this is more for the uh, what's coming, the time of Jacob's trouble, because if you were to read chapter 6, then it shows true repentance, okay? About going to the Lord, okay? For the time of Jacob's trouble and whatnot. But, chapter 5 here, when these people are going to lose everything, yeah, they're going to seek the Lord, and the fake are going to come in. And not deal with the true repentance. And Isaiah chapter 65. Isaiah chapter 65. And you know, there is not a litmus, litmus test where, you know, spit on this piece of paper. And, you know, and that's one of the things that started that whole disastrous debacle of Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Jesus is the Lord. That's what started that whole debacle in the first place. That people wanted an ipso facto right away. Aha! You're lost! Because you can, because someone who, and I fell for that. I was wrong in that. But see, people want a right away smoking gun that someone has lost. And there are smoking guns in some cases. But with these coadjutors, with these infiltrators, uh, some of them are very easy to spot. Some of them have been known but cover their tracks well. Uh, it takes time. Time which we don't have. But it takes time. It does take time. There is no ipso facto litmus test that you can give for someone. You have to. It takes time. It takes time. It takes time. Isaiah chapter 65, verses 1 under verse 7. I am sought of them that ask not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold, I said, Behold me, behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. It's talking about the Gentiles. How the Gentiles would seek unto God rather than God's chosen people. And God's chosen people, I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. Dispensationally, doctrinally, he is speaking of the Jewish people. Our instruction in righteousness. Boop, hello, look at the people today. And look at the Christians that come to uplift them in their sins. That to follow your heart. A people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face, that sacrificeth in gardens and burneth incense upon altars of brick which remain among the graves. Remain among the graves. Remain among the dead. Th those who are lost, there are dead in trespasses and sins. You gotta be like the world to win the world. These Christians in the buildings tell you. Yeah. 
and large in the monuments, which eat swine's flesh, and broth of abominable things is in their vessels, which say, Stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. These are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. Now these church-building Christians, um, they, they put off the thing that they're humble. But when you scripturally question their love everybody into the kingdom, God doesn't judge, then they become exactly this. Then again, there are these, which verse 5, these King James Bible-believing Christians who are set on pedestals by men who do take that, I'm better than you, holier than thou, get away from me, unclean. Ugh! There are those who do that too. Okay? Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silence, but will recompense, even recompense into their bosom. Your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, said the Lord, which have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills. Therefore will I measure their former work into their bosom. Most of these people, they're, they're in the pocket of the Vatican, whether they want to accept that or not. Okay? We here in America, our currency is Jesuit currency. Okay? And unless you have an independent bank like we do, um, in one way or another, your bank is probably tied to the Vatican. And of course, uh, this here is echoed in Romans chapter 10. Okay, Romans chapter 10. We'll just look at that one, uh, one verse. Romans chapter 10, verse 21. Okay. Romans chapter, uh, let's begin at uh, verse 18 on to verse 21 in Romans chapter 10. Okay. See, the true gospel has been put out there. But see, while those of us who are of the church of God are getting on each other over things that we shouldn't and not rather paying more close attention to what is going on right now and on witnessing to the lost, okay? Hence, the enemy is going to come in and sweep up these people that need the Lord, okay? And they're going to affirm them in their sin because their sin isn't going to be addressed, they're going to be given God loves you when they need to be told uh, you're not good. You're not righteous. There's no one good. You've sinned against God. God was a harmless. God was the harmless lamb who died on the cross for you. It's against him you have sinned. You know, when it rains, it pours. But see, when someone who is at that point, when they are willing to hear, when they are willing to do what they see is foolish. That's when we as the church of the living God, we ought to be there with the truth. But what happens? Because some of us are too scared. Some of us are, are thinking that we're not worthy enough. Or some of us are, just don't care enough. I got my other problems. If you're of the church of the living God, you are an ambassador for Christ. You have the word of re reconciliation and the ministry of reconciliation. You don't have to do this, but... Uh, man, woman, if there's an opportunity that the Lord has given you, take it! Okay? Because Romans chapter 10, verses 18 on to verse 21. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words to the end of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people and by a foolish nation will I anger you. Talking about us Gentiles. Okay, not a specific nation, but in a totality, us Gentiles, okay? But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them, we just read this, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel he saith, all day long have I stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Gainsaying people. And as a brother of mine uh, brought up, gainsaying appears three times in the scriptures, all within the New Testament. It's a compound word. It really is. And well, where context might not immediately offer on to, but gainsaying people, speaking lies and gaining from it. Like I said, context might not immediately show that, but when you think about it, these gainsaying people. It's yea, hath God said. 
is a gainsaying people. Yea, hath God said. And what are these people who are doing yea, hath God said? How are they benefiting? Look at them. Look at them here on YouTube with their 100,000 subscribers, with a video that gets millions of views, that has zero to little scripture in it. Usually they read a Bible. Anyway. You see? Now, let's look at an example of this. One of the best examples. Pharaoh. Let's look at Pharaoh. Now, we're going to we're going to dive into Pharaoh a little bit. We've done this before, but it is meet that it be doesn't be done now because for example, I know of a dearly dearly beloved who recently lost a family member and that uh, family member, surviving family member is asking all the right questions and praise the Lord. That's good. That's good. That's when you present the true gospel. Repentance toward God. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance of yourself, of your self-righteousness. Godly sorrow. They've sinned against God. It's their fault that he died. And fear the Lord. You're going to hell unless he save you. And he has every right to put you in hell. Okay? That's what needs to be preached. Okay? That's what needs to be preached. But you got to be careful. Even though someone comes in a broken uh, state, is it true brokenness? or world? Is it godly sorrow? Or is it worldly sorrow? Okay? Is it godly sorrow or worldly sorrow? Worldly sorrow leads on to death, like those in the Great, Dep uh, Great Depression who lost everything and pew, launched themselves out of windows. Godly sorrow that worketh repentance that will not be repented of. Okay? But let's, let's, let's examine a little bit Pharaoh. Go to Exodus chapter 8. Exodus chapter 8, verses 1 on to verse 7 to start. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Go unto Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. And if thou refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all thy borders with frogs. And the rivers shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into thine house, and into thy bed chamber, and upon thy bed, and into the house of thy servants, and upon thy people, and into thine ovens, and into thy kneading troughs, and all, and the frogs shall come up both on thee, and upon thy people, and upon all thy servants. Now, what's significant about what we're going to be looking at is, and we'll I'll note this when we get to it. N never mind, let's continue. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch forth thine hand with thy rod over the streams, over the rivers, and over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up upon the land of Egypt. And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments, and frogs, and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. Now, in uh, chapter 7, which we will be looking at, we will be looking at is uh, chapter 7 here, uh, here in a little bit. But you see the magicians also doing that, bringing, uh, using, uh, turning the, uh, what do they do? Uh, they, uh, they turned the water into blood, and they also did with their enchantments, they turned their rods into uh, serpents, Okay. But the rods on the serpents and also with the water turned into blood, um, you don't see Pharaoh do this. Verse 8 now in Exodus chapter uh, 8. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away from me away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let and I will let the people go that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. This is the first time that Pharaoh does this. He will do it continually as you read the story of the Exodus. Okay? But this is the first time he's like, okay, okay. Yeah, you brought frogs upon my land. So, okay. Entreat your, entreat your God for me that he take away. See, the point is that we're looking at this is 
Okay, the Lord brought frogs upon his land, and Pharaoh, whose heart was hardened. Well, we're going to get into that, don't worry. Even he, it's like, okay, yeah, okay, this is pretty serious. Pray unto the Lord. He, in his situation, was considering, considered the God of the Hebrews to take away the affliction. And what became of it? And Moses said unto Pharaoh, Glory over me, when shall I entreat for thee, and for thy servants, and for thy people, to destroy the frogs from thee and thy houses, that they may remain in the river only? And he said, Tomorrow. And he said, Be it according to thy word, that thou mayest know that there is none like unto the Lord our God, and the frogs shall depart from thee and from thy houses and from thy servants and from thy people. They shall remain in the river only. And Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh. And Moses cried unto the Lord because of the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. And the frogs died out of the houses and of the villages and out of the fields. And they gathered them together upon heaps and the land stank. Verse 15. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, that things got better. Willing in affliction to consider what before. He said, who's the Lord? I know not the Lord. Why are you getting the people, taking them away from their burdens? What, what's with you? Ye are idle. Ye are idle, right? But in this affliction, not the one of the, the rods and the serpents, not the water and the blood, but the frogs. He was willing to go unto the Lord, the God of the Hebrews. Not himself personally, of course, but he was willing to consider. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. He hardened his heart. And what's the argument that people will bring up about Pharaoh? Is well, Lord hardened his heart. Yes, he did. Uh, Exodus chapter 9, verse 16. Exodus chapter 9, verse 16. And in very deed for this cause have I raised thee up, for to shew in thee my power, and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. Okay? So yes, the Lord did harden in Pharaoh's heart. But here's the thing. Because people, what's the argument? Uh, that, well, for what fair, what chance had Pharaoh? Pharaoh didn't have a chance. And also the Calvinists will sweep in with their elect and non-elect because Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Pharaoh's heart was already hardened before the Lord did it. Okay? Because you've got to remember something about the Pharaohs. Okay? And we're going to look at this. I'm not going to get ahead of myself here. But you've got to remember that the Pharaohs thought themselves to be God. The Pharaohs were looked upon as God. Okay? Hence, Pharaoh's heart was already hardened against the Lord before the Lord continued. Because rationally, rationally, even atheists will bring up about Pharaoh. It's like, wow, after the first, after the first couple of judgments, I would have been like, okay, you guys go ahead. Do what you're going to do. Get out. Do take, take as much time. Even atheists will say that. Have brought that up. So like, yeah, man, I'll do that first couple of them. I would have been like, get, get out of here. But see, Pharaoh's heart was already hardened to begin with before the Lord continued it. And he did it to make a point. Uh, Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. Okay. Verses 17 on to verse 24. And this hardening of the heart, brethren, is what we need to watch out for. Because Pharaoh, we're going to see, was brought to one of his loved ones died. And he repented. But then he was, when it was a dog that returned to his own vomit. I'm getting ahead of myself. Romans chapter 9, verses 17 on to verse 24. We already looked at this in uh, Exodus chapter 9. Don't, don't look at me. Follow along in the scriptures. What's Come on. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might shew my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. 
Therefore he hath mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. And see, the Calvinist says, elect and non-elect, that they're reprobate and that they can't be saved. We all have free will, we have a choice. Yes, God ultimately knows whom are his. Yes, he does. But he gives people the choice. He knew that the children of Israel were going to reject him in the kingdom of heaven. And he went to the cross anyway. Okay. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Okay. He would not be a fair and just judge, even though he knows the outcome, if he didn't offer it anyway. Okay. But see, a man or a woman can get to a place where their heart is so hard that they are gone. That they are gone. That when the Lord appears to them, <laughs> they wouldn't even flinch. Okay? Let's continue. Thou wilt say unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O oh man, who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made, it, made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay, the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? Now, you got to remember, this right here is talking about saved and lost, okay? The context is about Pharaoh here that Paul is talking about. Pharaoh obviously is in hell, okay? And when he says right here, a vessel unto honor and another to dishonor, one in this context is saved and one is lost. And we are going to be looking in 2 Timothy. And I got to correct an error of mine that we're going to be looking at, okay? But I'm getting ahead of myself, okay? But right here in uh, Romans chapter 9, the context clearly shows us that when he says, Hath not the power, potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? We are all of dirt, okay? One who has a hardened heart already and has already made their choice, God is going to send them strong delusion. They, they don't want the Lord. The Lord's going to give them what they want, not him. Along comes Satan, okay? What if God, willing to shew his wrath, which we, the church of the living God, are not appointed to, and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering. Patience and long suffering, they are different things. We are to be patient, yes, as the Lord is patient with us. Long suffering, long suffering, compound word, suffering long with the works of the wicked. There is a difference between long-suffering and patience, okay? Number one, we of the church of the living God are not appointed to wrath, okay? You read that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, okay? And long-suffering, our Lord shows patience to his own, long-suffering to those who are not, okay? What if God, willing to shew his wrath, and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. Afore prepared unto glory. It doesn't mean the Calvinistic elect and non elect. When you come to the Lord on his terms, your destination is fixed. You're going to heaven, okay? That glory is a for a what? A for prepared in Christ when you come to him on his terms. It's not elect and not elect like Calvin teaches. That's heresy, okay? Link for that will be in the description box. Even us who hath he, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Okay? Okay? Pharaoh's heart was already hardened, dear brethren, before the Lord helped it along. Okay? His heart. Go to Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah chapter 18. Okay? Because, yes, you know, well, your God didn't give Pharaoh a chance. Pharaoh had a chance, but his heart was already hardened because he was Pharaoh. He saw himself as God. And we're going to look at that. The very first incident when uh, Moses went to him, what does what did Pharaoh do? We'll look at that. But Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 on to verse 10. 
The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there will I cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I, cannot I do with you as with this potter, said the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. At what instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it. Okay? If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil. Different dispensation. Yes, it is. But turn from their evil. The instruction in righteousness is clearly there. Okay? I will repent, turn, of the evil that I thought to do unto them. You have choice. Okay? You have free will. God has given man free will. Unlike what Mr. Calvin taught. Okay? They have free will, but see, you say that as the elect you have free will, and as the non-elect you have free will. Not that you have free will to say yea or nay. Okay? You Calvinists say that the free will is there in something that is already assigned to them. Not that they have the free will to accept or reject. Okay? Heresy. And, and, at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and, a, and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight, that, they, that it obey not my voice, then I will, will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. Even in this, the Old Testament here, denotes choice. We've talked about that before. We have free will. We have free will. Okay? Okay? Now, go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. It was made aware to me, now, where I cannot find it, but I have to publicly repent and confess an error, if in fact I did. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 19 on to verse 21, if I ever in any video said that in, I can't see that, that in regards to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 19 on to verse 21, if I ever said that one of these is saved and lost, I was wrong. That was an error, and I publicly repent of that. If I ever said, and the Lord has given me a lot of videos to do, so if I said it, I think I did. I can't remember which one. Unfortunately, my enemies could probably find it because they have no life or time, uh, and time to do that. But if I did indeed say that, that when it comes to 19 on to verse 21 in 2 Timothy chapter 2, that one is saved and one is lost, I repent, I was wrong and in error, forgive me. Okay, if I did that, I think I did, but I, I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. If I did, I was wrong, okay, because 2 Timothy chapter 2, I was wrong, forgive me, I repent, please forgive me. What is this passage saying? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 19 on to verse 21, okay? Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Amen, he does. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But, in a great house, stop right there, in a great house. The Lord has gone to prepare a house for us, right? A mansion? So, in a great house, what, whose house is this great house? The Lord knoweth those who, them that are his. The house of the Lord. Okay? Of his body, of his flesh. Meaning, they are of my house. Meaning, not the building, but belong unto him. So, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth. And some to honor, and some to dishonor. If I ever said that these 
are lost, one is lost and one is saved, I repent. Please forgive me. I was wrong. Okay. Why? Because the context, the Lord knows who those are his, and in a great house. What greater house is there than the Lord's house? And it's not talking about a building. Okay. We are of the Lord's house because we are of his body. Okay. See how that works? Not a building. Okay. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified meat for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. And what about the one that's unto dishonor? Hmm? And for that, we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And a sad reality. Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 11 on to verse 17. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. God know, The Lord knoweth those who are his. Amen. And in a great house, okay, the vessel unto honor and the vessel to dishonor. Both were saved. But... Now, if any man build on this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Gold, silver, precious stones will abide fire. Wood, hay, and stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Our works for rewards. Okay? If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved at yet so as by fire, not purgatory. Okay? Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man, including yourself, defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Do you realize that there are going to be those in heaven who are dishonored by the Lord, but yet in heaven. Because if they came to the Lord on his terms, broken and contrite, and feared the Lord, called upon his name, and the Lord saved him, and he is sealed unto the day of redemption, he's going to heaven no matter what. But as I've talked with you before, there are going to be those in heaven whom the Lord is going to look upon with shame. Why? Because in their life, the honor of our Lord Jesus Christ meant nothing to them. And they lived as the devil. So, and these people, these, some of these is like, well, at least I'm getting into heaven. See, that shows that you're more concerned about your own hide than the one who died for you. Well, at least I'll be in heaven. Yes, but the Lord eternally ashamed of you. There are those, brethren, of the church of the living God, those who are saved, born again, but not converted. There are those who are going to be up in heaven, who all their life saved, born again, converted, well, not converted, excuse me, but saved. But they refused the new man. Remember, God doesn't force us to do anything. Neither does Satan force us to do anything. Okay? You have free will. Excuse me. Okay? You are to choose to do what is right. And as 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 11 on to verse 17 prove, there are going to be some up there who just get in, but all their lives you lived as a devil. And the Lord's going to look at you at that... I saved you, and this is how you repaid me, okay? This, you know, your reasonable service, this is what you did with your life after I saved you. Just get in there, get away from me, I don't want to even look at you. Yes, brethren, 
there are going to be those in heaven who their entire life lived as one of them. And they're going to go to heaven. There are those that are, are like that. Okay? Now, how do you discern between the two? How do you discern the, between the two? Because right away, some of these enemies of ours will be, well, that's me. If you know that's you and you do nothing to do what's right in the sight of the Lord, no, I don't believe for a second you're saved. You're, you're lost. If, you're, if you are one, it's like, well, at least I'm going to get into heaven. And there's no chastening in your life and you're still alive. But see, if you are of the Lord and you're still alive, meaning that you haven't been given over to the destruction of the flesh, okay, your testimony, your life as the church of God means nothing. Your witness and your testimony means nothing. How can it with all your lies that you have told? But that is something we need to consider, brethren. Yes, there are some out there who are going to be in heaven who lived their whole life as a devil. It's going to happen. We just looked at the proof of it. I don't want to be one of those. What about you? And if you're okay with being one of those, we know that's going to happen, but I doubt you're saved. And you continue... In that, being aware, this ought to be a rebuke to you, okay? If you are truly saved, and you're living as a devil, and you're with this man, well, at least I'm going to get into heaven, and you have no desire to live godly according to the scriptures, but only put on a facade, you're not saved. But if you are, this ought to be a rebuke to you. Because it proves that our Lord's honor, the one who died and buried and rose again the third day, who shed his blood for you, which apparently some of you claim to have had contrition for, but yet his honor means nothing to you. I question you. I question you. I question you. Okay? I, I do. I, I seriously question you. Now, so what about Pharaoh then, right? Go to Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4, verses 21 on to verse 23. Exodus chapter 4, verses 21 on to verse 23. Come on, fingers work with me. Exodus chapter 4, verses 21 on to verse 23. And the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, See that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand. But I will harden his heart, that he shall not let the people go. So the Lord says right there first that, yes, he's going to harden Pharaoh's heart. But let's hold on. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. Okay? Now, with this, go to Exodus chapter 7. Okay? Exodus chapter 7. Let's read verses 1 on to verse 7. Okay? This is when Moses first goes to Pharaoh. Okay? Okay, one second, brethren. All right, sorry about that. Here's where Moses goes to Pharaoh. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a little g God to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee. And Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, and he shall that he send the children of Israel out of his land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, that I may lay my hand upon Egypt, and bring forth mine armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And the Egyptians, 
and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch forth my hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. And Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded them, so did they. And Moses was fourscore years old, and Aaron fourscore and three years old, when they spake unto Pharaoh. And when you look, if we were to continue reading, okay, he goes on to Pharaoh. Let's read on to verse 13. Okay? And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh, Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Shew a miracle for you, then thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod, and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh, and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Look at what Pharaoh did before. Now the Lord said, I will harden his heart. Look at what Pharaoh did before the Lord actually went and hardened his heart. Okay, the Lord up till then was just saying, I'm going to do this. But when the Lord first did it, look at what Pharaoh did. It's very telling. Telling. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Okay. He wasn't like, whoa, whoa. Instead, he's like, yeah. Well, here, look at what my, my guys can do. Shows where his heart was. It sh then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Okay? That first miracle, okay? Personally, it's like, whoa. Okay, man, what you got to say? All right? What you got to say? Knowing that Mo Moses and Aaron, they weren't sorcerers. But what did Pharaoh do? It's like, hey, come here. See what you can do there, right? Go ahead. Shows where his heart was. His heart was already hardened. Why? Well, he went to the magicians, the sorcerers. They also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. And he hardened Pharaoh's heart that he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. There you see the Lord hardening Pharaoh's heart for the first time. Some will argue, well, it was already declared. But we see here that in the first instance, the first thing of the plagues or the signs and whatnot, okay, the first thing Pharaoh did was not to consider what he saw, but went to the magicians and the sorcerers, sorcerers and the magicians and stuff like that, okay? That's very telling. That shows you, verse 11 shows you where Pharaoh's heart was already at. Okay? And you want to know where Pharaoh's heart was at? Okay? You want to know? Because remember, like I said, Pharaoh was seen as a god. He himself believed he was a god. The Pharaohs at these times believed them to be gods. Okay? And they were treated and revered as gods. Okay? Ezekiel chapter 28. This was the heart of Pharaoh before the Lord even did anything to him. This was the heart of Pharaoh. Okay? This was the heart of Pharaoh. Exodus, uh, Exodus. Ezekiel chapter 28. This was the heart of Pharaoh. Okay? This is what Pharaoh's heart was before the Lord hardened it. Okay? You look into history. Don't take my word for it. The Pharaoh's thought themselves gods. The pharaohs were worshipped as God. Ezekiel 28, verses 1 and verse 10 to start. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, Because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a capital G, God. I sit in the seat of God. In the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man, and not God. Though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. And that's exactly what Pharaoh's heart was. Excuse me, it's pronounced Pharaoh. What Pharaoh's heart was. Right there. Right there. 
before King Atyrus ever was on the scene. Okay? Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches, and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. Just like the pharaohs. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic, thou hast increased thy riches, and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. Oh, is this not a telltale sign to of the people of today? They're walking around thinking that they are gods! Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God. And that's a capital G there. Behold, therefore, I will bring strangers upon thee. The terrible of the nations. And they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom. And they shall defile thy brightness. They shall bring thee down to the pit. And thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? Kind of like Pharaoh. When he said, who is the Lord? Who is the Lord? Ye are idle. Ye are idle. Okay. Ye are idle. <laughs> because he goes on to him and he, say, he says that and he's like, you are idle. Uh, where is that? Hold your place here. Uh, when he says that on to them, uh, one second, let me find it. Okay, sorry about that. In Exodus chapter 5, verses 2 on to verse 5. Now, Moses and Aaron, yes, appeared to Pharaoh before uh, what we had read earlier. Yes, he did. Yes, they did. But... When they appeared with the uh, serpent, see, this time uh, they didn't appear with signs and wonders, did they? They just went to, uh, well, let's read verses 1 under verse 5 in uh, Exodus chapter 5. And afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of, the Hebrew, of Israel, Let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. And see, this is before you don't read about him hardening his heart until, until what we had already looked at in Exodus chapter 7. Okay, the, they went to the, yes, Moses and Aaron went to uh, Pharaoh before that in Exodus 7, yes. But in Exodus 7, that is when the uh, Lord started to harden his heart. Okay, that's when he actually started to do it. He said he was going to do it here on out, but look at this. And they said, verse 3, The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days' journey into the desert, and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with sword. Or with the sword. And the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people, even from their works, get you unto your burdens? And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and ye make them rest from their burdens. See, verse 4, or verse 2. Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Okay? And you do not read about how the Lord sacrificed or how the Lord hardened his heart in Exodus chapter 5. Also proving to you that Pharaoh's heart was hardened even before, even before he said within scripture, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. He says he will harden his heart in Exodus chapter 4. Moses and Aaron appeared to him. Okay, you see what his heart is. It also showed you in uh, Exodus chapter uh, 7 verse 11 where his heart was okay we saw that but this even more so okay and the first time they appear with the signs and the wonders that is when when they first appeared to him doing signs there, there were no signs and wonders done here were there were there but Pharaoh's heart was made manifest that he, he says I don't know the Lord because Pharaoh 
was exactly like we are looking at in Exodus chapter 28. He thought he was a god. And then in Exodus chapter 7, when they first appeared before Pharaoh doing signs and wonders, that is when the Lord then hardened his heart so that he could make a, an example out of him. See, Pharaoh's heart was already hardened. Okay? Have you not seen the proof of that before? Because people will argue, well, what, choice, what chance had Pharaoh? Every chance. But he thought he was a god. He thought he was God. Verse 6 and back in Ezekiel chapter 28. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God. Behold, therefore I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness. They shall bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the sea. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? But thou shalt be a man and no God in the hand of him that slayeth thee. Thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers. For I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. Hence, Pharaoh's heart was already hardened. For the Lord just gave it along as it would go already. Okay? So, for you to say, well, Pharaoh had no chance. Pharaoh had every chance, but historically, scripturally, Pharaoh's heart was already hardened before the Lord just furthered it along. Okay? Why was that? Let's continue in Ezekiel chapter 28. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Just like Pharaoh thought he was. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Tyrus was not in the garden of Eden, but the serpent was. The serpent, Satan, Lucifer, the devil. That's whom the Lord is addressing in this passage of scripture. This is about Satan, who was using Tyrus, who, was, um, who Tyrus was being manipulated by. Pharaoh! In Moses' time, especially, a type of Satan who knows not the Lord, whose heart was already hardened. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. Till iniquity was found in thee. What was that iniquity? Created. He was created being. Satan is a created being. By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence. Now has sin. Therefore will I cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness, because all those stones made him look beautiful. See, angel of light, okay? I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before king that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. The ultimate end of Satan. And hence, too, this is why we looked at this, because that's what Pharaoh was. Excuse me. That's what Pharaoh was. Okay? But even Pharaoh, okay, they appeared to him first time without any signs and wonders. Okay? I was wrong in saying that. But we, look, we, we corrected it in this video. Thank you. Praise the Lord. But, okay, first time they appeared, it's like, hey, you let the people go. You see what Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's heart was. His heart was already hardened. And then by Exodus chapter 7, the Lord has been saying, I'm going to harden his heart. Yeah, I mean, look at him. Look at Pharaoh. 
His heart was hardened before the Lord just continued it along. Because most rational people, even atheists have said this, after the first couple of uh, signs and wonders, we rational people would have been like, whoa, get out! And don't let the door hit you in the buttocks! But no, Pharaoh, whose heart, he, he thought he was a god. Okay? Pharaoh, whose heart was already hardened, the Lord kept going and kept it along to make a point of him. Okay? But his heart was already hardened. But, even with someone like Pharaoh, go to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12, we want verses 29 on to verse 36. After all this stuff, him doing half-hearted, okay, go, but who's going to stay? No, okay, go, get out, and, and nothing happened. But it took this. Someone close to Pharaoh died. He lost everything, but it wasn't enough. Until Exodus 12, verses 29 on to verse 36. And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of cattle. And when the people start dying here in the next couple of years because of the steel of the Jesuit poniard. And Pharaoh, and Pharaoh rose up in the night he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. And he called, look at this, and he called for Moses and Aaron by night. Now he's willing to go to those who represent the true God. Look what it took. Look what it took. And said, rise up, and get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as ye have said. Also take your flocks and your herds, and, and as ye have said, and be gone, and bless me also. Get out! Rational people? <laughs> we would have been like what? Yeah, way earlier. But see, Pharaoh's heart, excuse me, Pharaoh's heart was hardened already to begin with. Okay? He thought he was a god. He thought he was God. Oh, he, he found out the hard way, didn't he? But it took something so personal and close to him. He was, all of Egypt was destroyed. But then when it came close to home, then he was willing to repent. And the Egyptians were urging upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we be all dead men. And the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses. And they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they lent unto them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. Yes. Yes. And when people start dying and people start losing all their stuff, like Pharaoh, going to be willing to go to what he before he considered absurd, whose heart was already hardened. But in this, he repented. But now go to Exodus chapter 14. Okay? Exodus chapter 14. Look at this. Verses 1 under verse 9. Did that repentance endure? Did that thing in Pharaoh endure? And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak, uh, Exodus 14, verses 1 under verse 9. These are the type of people, brethren, that are going to be uh, coming, that we're going to see, coming in the future, the near future. We need to be prepared for this. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Piharioth, between Migdol and the sea, over against Baal Zephon. Before it shall ye encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are entangled in the land, the wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, whose, already, whose heart was already hardened. Okay? 
whose heart was already hardened before the Lord just carried it along. But let's continue, okay? That he shall follow after them. And I will, and I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. And you might say, well, God did that. Uh, Pharaoh's heart from the beginning, we've already looked at it, proven it to you, his heart was already hardened before the Lord brought it along. Had the Lord not have done anything, I still believe, of course, that Pharaoh would have done this. Why? We also will look at another incidence of this where someone does something that is right in the sight of the Lord, but their hearts aren't in the right place. And just like the seed sown on stony ground, they endure for a while, but they turn. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. And they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. And he took 600 chari chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and the captains over every one of them. Okay? Look at verse 5. Look at verse 5. And the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. Okay? For your argument, well, uh, he was God, the Lord made him to do this. Their heart was turned already. Look at verse 6, or look at verse 8. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Verse 5, their hearts already turned against the children of Israel. Why have we done this? They already did it in 5. Then, in verse 8, is when the Lord hardened their heart. Do you see? Their hearts were already gone. And the Lord, just like in 2 Thessalonians, they love not the truth. Therefore God shall send them strong delusion that they may believe a lie. Because why? They love not the truth. Okay? And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with a high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after, after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them in camping by the sea beside Piharioth before Balsaphon. We see another example of this in Jeremiah chapter 34. Jeremiah chapter 34. In scripture, it tells the, the children of Israel that they weren't supposed to keep their, their brethren, Hebrew servants, for only up to amount of years. And then they were to let them go. They weren't doing that. So in uh, Jeremiah chapter 34, verses 8 under verse 11. This is the word that came unto Jeremiah from the Lord after that Zedekiah, and after that King Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people which were at Jerusalem to proclaim liberty unto them. That every man should let his manservant and every man his maidservant, being in Hebrew or in Hebrewess, go free, that none should serve himself of them to wit of a Jew his brother. And that is in the, that is according to the law. Okay? Now when all, when all the princes and all the people which had entered into the covenant heard that everyone should let his manservant and everyone his maidservant go free, that none should serve themselves of them any more, then they obeyed and let them go, doing according what was uh, what was according to the law. Pharaoh did what was right. Finally, let the people go. Went to the Lord. Let the people go. They. It's like, yeah, it's in the law that we're supposed to do this. So they make a covenant. They do what's right. But after they turned and caused the servants and the maid handmaids whom they had. Let go free to return and brought them into subjection for servants and for handmaids. So they did what was right according to the scripture, according to the law. But only for a while, then they turned and took them back again. As a dog returneth unto his own vomit. Okay? And of course, 
you, you know, we got to remember about these people and, and this time in Jeremiah chapter 43, favorite part of scripture for me. Um, they go to Jeremiah, Nebuchadnezzar comes and whoops them. You know this, okay? Then they go to Jeremiah, it's like, hey, go to the Lord, whatever he tells you, we're going to do it. No matter what he says, we're going to do it. And the Lord's like, they're not going to do it. But tell them what I said. He says, don't go down to Egypt. And they said that whatever the Lord said, and you can read that in Jeremiah chapter 42, they said, whatever it is, we're going to do it. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 43, verses 1 on verse 3. And it came to pass that when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking unto all the people, all the words of the Lord their God, for which the Lord their God had sent him to them, even all these words, then spake Azariah the son of Hoshiah, and Johanan the son of Kera, and all the proud men. Saying unto Jeremiah, Thou speakest falsely, the Lord our God hath not sent thee to say, <laughs> Go not into Egypt to sojourn there. You, you look on your own time in Jeremiah chapter 42. They said, whether it be good or whether it be evil, we will do what the Lord said. But see, they were putting on a facade. They wanted to, they, they were putting on the outward adornment that, see, we're righteous, we're good. We're going to do what God says no matter if we don't like it. Guess what? They didn't like it. And what did they say? <laughs> Thou speakest falsely. God didn't say that. But Baruch. The son of Neriah set it on against us for to deliver us into the hand of the Chaldeans that they might put us to death and carry us away captives into Babylon. <laughs> it's not funny, but it shows. It shows us something, okay? What does it show us, brethren? That even when someone is at what they seem to be their lowest point, Yes, that's the time when we present the gospel to them. But we have to be on their on our guard. We have to really question those people. Uh, I, I know, and we want to be sympathetic. We want to have compassion. It's like, the, 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 the dude just lost his house. The dude just lost his wife. Or or she just lost her, her father and, and, and lost her house. Uh, we understand that. But we got to be aware. Our, is that brokenness? Because... They are, have godly sorrow because they sinned against the Lord or is it worldly sorrow because they just lost everything they own? Because even in the extremities of these things, we have to remember uh, Jeremiah chapter 44 verses 15 under verse 19. Then all the men were, this is after they disobeyed the Lord, they were warned, Okay, and here is early Catholicism in the scripture. Yes, it is. Then all the men which knew that their wives had burnt incense unto other gods, and all the women that stood by a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt, and Pathros answered Jeremiah, saying, The women, you want to destroy the household? Go after the woman, like Satan did. Okay? Satan can destroy a household by going to the man. Yes, he can. But scripturally, Satan goes to the woman first. You feminazi women out there, you got to beware. Okay, that feminazi, I won't have a man to rule over me and that kind of stuff. Even though you say you want one, um, you got to be careful. You got to be careful. You really got to be careful. Okay. As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto Mary, the Queen of Heaven. Okay, doesn't say Mary there. But Queen of Heaven, that's the Catholic Mary. This right here, this is the Catholic Mary. And to pour out drink offerings unto her, as we have done, we and our fathers, our kings and our princes, in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then had we plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil. But since we left off to burn incense unto the Queen of Heaven, the Roman Catholic Mary, and to pour out drink offerings unto her, the wine that becomes blood, 
We have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. And when we burned incense to the Queen of Heaven, the Roman Catholic Mary, and poured out drink offerings onto her, the cup that becomes, the wine that becomes blood, did we make her cakes to worship her, the little wafer cookie that becomes the flesh that the satanic devils worship? And pour out drink offerings onto her without, without our men? Is their heart truly broken? Is it godly sorrow? Or is it worldly sorrow? Worldly sorrow what leads to what? Death. Godly sorrow, sure, leads to the death of self, but leads unto life. Okay, those of you who argue about, well, he just, we're going to look at the uh, Philippian jailer, by the way, if we have time, even if we don't have time, we're going to, we're going to look at the Philippian jailer. Okay, because the easy believism heretic comes in. He doesn't doubt that they, the easy believism heretic doesn't doubt, doesn't dispute that the Philippian jailer was broken, but they like to say it was worldly sorrow. Worldly sorrow leads to death. The Philippian jailer was going to kill himself, but he didn't succeed, did he? Did he? Well, Paul said, shh, shh, shh. Worldly sorrow leads to death. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Okay? We're getting ahead of ourselves. Go to Isaiah chapter 1. Brethren, I know this sounds cold, but we have to be... When they, when they start dying... Gas is now 515 in some places here in Illinois. The, sta the, the standard of life, the price, the cost of living is rising. The quality of life is deteriorating. Okay? Unless you've got 40,000 reasons to smile and all this stuff and you're high on the hog. But for most of us, the cost of uh, living is, is accelerating through the roof and the quality is deteriorating. Hence, people are going to go to the Lord when their loved ones start dying, when they start losing things. But is that... Hey, and hey, again, praise the Lord. That's when they're susceptible to the true gospel. But see, see, you listen to me. When those people are like that, you preach to them brokenness, repentance, because the enemies are going to sweep in. God loves you. Just believe. Okay? You preach to them Romans 3, 10 through 18. You preach to them Psalm 51. Okay? That they ain't good. That it's their fault that Christ died. Okay? Because these scumbag devils, when these people start dying and losing everything, these scumbag devils are going to sweep in and make a mess out of everything. We need to preach the true gospel. Repentance isn't going from unbelief to belief. The repentances of yourself. Okay? We need to preach that. We need to preach that when these people start losing everything. Because you watch. When they start losing everything. When people start losing things. And dying. People are dying. These easy believers of scum. Okay? They're going to come in with that stuff. And where are we? Oh, you're lost because you want to worship a Christmas tree. <laughs> or you're lost because you speak against Christmas. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And all the while with these idolaters of the church of the living God, okay, and all the while Satan is laughing. Why is it now that the devil is laughing? Wake up, people. Because, because, okay, Isaiah chapter 1, verses 2 and verse 6, Hear, O heaven, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nursed up, I, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Speaking of Israel. The comparison. The ox knoweth his owner. The dumb animal that can't speak, that doesn't have a soul. The ass his master's crib. An animal that can't speak and doesn't have a soul knows who's who. 
But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. Animals know who's who, know who God is. They do. <laughs> they do. They don't have a soul. They don't have wisdom to fear the Lord. Okay? They have the fear of man in them. Okay? But the creatures have more sense. And that's comparison. These creatures have more sense than some of these people today. Especially the Christians in the building who want to dispute with you. I'm saved because I believe. What about his grace through faith? You've saved yourself by your belief. Or you've saved yourself because you skip over repentance, contrition, and fear of the Lord. You just merely called upon the name of the Lord. Come on. A sinful nation. A people laden with iniquity. A seed of evildoers. Children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backwards. Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Hence, a lot of these people today why should they? Yeah, or if you're of the church of the living God, living as a devil, and there's no chastisement, you, you ought to be terrified. You're actually saved and living as a devil and prospering? Oh boy, you better be you better be really afraid. Because who's the one who's answering your prayers in actuality? Who is the one who's been given over to the destruction of the flesh? If oxes and asses know their master's crib and know who their owners are, yet these people don't know or don't consider. Not, it's, not a, it's not even that. They don't want to know. And uh, a dear brother who out of nowhere sent this to me, and you know who you are, brother, from Nehum. Nehum. Go to Nahum. Uh, we, I, 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 Nahum is right after Micah. Uh, this dear brother sent this to me out of this clear blue, and it's like, wow, <laughs> wow. Nahum. Nahum is after Micah. We want verses 8 on to verse 13. But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof. And darkness shall pursue his enemies. Why do ye? What do ye imagine against the Lord? He will make another end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time, because it's going to be sufficient the first time. For while they be folded together as thorns, and while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble fully dry. There is none. There is one come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked. Counselor. Ooh, son of perdition? One come out of thee, okay, that imagineth evil against the Lord? One of your own? Hmm? Thus saith the Lord, though they be quiet, and likewise many, yet thus shall they be cut down when he shall pass through. Though I have afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. For now will I break his yoke from off thee, and will burst thy bonds asunder. <laughs> That's a warning. Judgment is coming upon America. And many people who have family members who have received the poison of the steel of the Jesuit poniard, I believe in the next couple of years they're going to start seeing them drop off and die. And plus, with inflation rising, where people can't afford to live anymore, things are going to start going to hell in a handbasket. And like I said, these people that lose these things, they are going to be ripe 
to hear the true gospel. But we, as the church of the living God, we need to be diligent out there and preach the true gospel so that when this happens, because I believe it's not going to happen, absolutely. So when it happens that these devil coadjutor satanic puke bags with their easy believism, believism heresy where we're not being diligent with the gospel these devils are going to come in and cast a death sentence on these poor people who are willing to hear anything without a hitch God loves you just believe this happened to you because you rebelled against God because you didn't choose him. Because you decided to go with the Vatican. You are reaping what you have sown. You put Christ on the cross. You're a sinner. It's your fault. And yes, when someone loses everything, that's the last thing they want to hear. But it's the thing they need to hear, man. Okay? I, and I say that to myself. Because one of my weaknesses. I'm a... I'm, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm naive like that. I'm gullible. I see someone broken and I want to be compassionate. To be kind, like Shakespeare says, in order to be kind, sometimes you have to be cruel. And that cruelty is when someone has lost everything, this is a recompense to you from the Lord. Because you have rebelled against him and you chose not the way that pleases the Lord. Your sin put Jesus Christ on the cross. And guess what? If he doesn't save you, you're going to hell. Christ died for sins according to the scriptures. And he buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And guess what? Christ Jesus came to save sinners of whom I am chief. Guess what? That includes you. You're a sinner. You are a sinner. We are. When this happens, brethren, we need to be vigilant and be out there preaching that true gospel. Because you watch, when this happens, these easy believism devils, they're going to start their little revival. There's going to come prosperity when all the people die because they're going to come with their God loves you. You watch. You watch. We need to be di diligent. We need to be vigilant, brethren. We really do. We really do. Because they're going to believe on the Lord and all the wrong things. Okay? They really are. They really are. See, when these people, when they lose everything, the easy believe is some heretic. Go to Romans chapter 3. What do you guys use? What do you guys use? Right? What do you guys use? You, you go from uh, what? Um... From what? Verse 21 on to verse 26? This is where they go. The pure gospel. Yeah. They go to the guy who's lost everything. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is made manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. <laughs> For all have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. This is true. But see, what the easy believism heretic omits is what comes before this, which deals with personal self-repentance or self-righteousness, breaking them of their self-righteousness. That's what the easy believism heretic omits. Okay? That's what they omit. And this right here, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yes, that is true. Amen. Hallelujah. But what about you personally? See, they omit that. They omit that. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So just believe. Just believe. But see, what they are omitting, as it is written. If you follow me along, you know what we're looking at. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. That includes you. 
We've all said, what about you? You personally. See, Romans 1 and Romans 2 and up to verse 18 is about you personally. Yeah, it doesn't have your name in it, but it's got your name written all out of it. Okay? It deals with your personal self-righteousness, which the easy believe is a heretic, just whoo -hoo! And then the calling on the name of the Lord thing. Okay? The, the lesser calling on the greater. The ultimate act of humility. Lord, save me. They don't like that because they're not truly saved. Because they save themselves by their belief. That easy believism, brethren, that is going to be the ultimate thing that we have to deal with before the redemption of the person. And it is what we are dealing with it now. There are so many out there that will speak so right and so close scripturally. Then when it comes to the gospel, just believe. And yes, belief is part of it. But how do you arrive at that belief? As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. And that includes you. Well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. You still got your self-righteousness. Okay? Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used to see. The poison of asps is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. Why? There is no fear of God before their eyes. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's what the easy believism heretic omits. And makes false converts who are zealous, very, very zealous, you need to be broken of your self-righteousness. Anyone who is truly saved and born again of the church of the living God, it's my fault. Christ died because of what I did. Yeah, we're all, but never mind. It's me. It's me, oh Lord. I did it. I'm at fault. Okay? I'm sorry. Forgive me. Save me. I am the chief of sinners. But someone who isn't truly saved. Well, we're all sinners. I'm not as bad as so-and-so. And unless these people are broken, truly broken, that's a good start. Losing everything. Yes, it is. And yes, They'll be like a little sponge. But like I said, we've got to beware and be mindful. That's when Satan's going to come in, swoop, on, swoop in, and take them all away from us. Take them all away from the Lord. But yea, hath God said, just believe. And emitting, omitting repentance, godly sorrow, and fear the Lord calling upon the name of the Lord. Okay? There is hope, brethren. There is hope. There is hope for these people. Because when you read in the scriptures, go to 2 Chronicles. Go to 2 Chronicles. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 33. There are examples. Now, this is a different dispensation. Okay. Second Chronicles chapter 33. King Manasseh. King Manasseh. King Manasseh was the son of Hezekiah. King Manasseh was the son of Hezekiah, given to Hezekiah within the 15 years of the grace that the Lord gave unto Hezekiah for Hezekiah weeping sore unto, a sore unto the Lord for more life. And how did Hezekiah reward that extra time that the Lord gave him? King Manasseh. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, born within the 15 years of that the Lord gave him. And he reigned 15 and 5 years in Jerusalem. 
but did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord unto the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. For he built again the high places which Hezekiah his father had broken down, and reared up altars for Baalim, and made groves, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven, and served them. Also he built altars in the house of the Lord, whereof the Lord had said in Jerusalem shall my name be forever. And he built altars for all the host of heaven, and in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Also he observed times, and used enchantments, and used witchcraft, and dealt with a familiar spirits, spirit, spirit, and with wizards. <laughs> that ghost that appears to you with the long hair, familiar spirit, familiar to your flesh. Yeah, yeah, get saved, man. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And he set a carved image, the idol which he had made, Hmm, carved image. Hmm. In the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem will I have cho which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel will I put my name forever. Neither will I any more remove the foot of Israel from out of the land which I have appointed for your fathers, so that they will take heed to do all that I have commanded them, according to the whole law and the statutes and the ordinances by the hand of Moses. So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err, and to do worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. Did worse. And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hear. Manasseh was the worst of the worst. Wherefore the Lord brought, we're reading to verse 13, by the way. Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Syria, which earlier we read about how they went to him, the king of Assyria, yeah. Which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. So Manasseh lost everything. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God. And even though he lost everything, and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. See, when these people lose their loved ones and their houses and all their stuff, they're going to lose everything. But are they going to be there? Are they going to beseech the Lord and humble themselves greatly? That's what we, the Church of the Living God, are going to be there for. We need to show them the true gospel, because their mentality will be what? Haven't I lost enough? No, apparently not. Well, Manasseh lost everything. And in everything he lost, where did he go to? He went to the Lord and humbled himself greatly. See, these easy believers and heretics, they're going to sweep in. And these people are not going to humble themselves greatly because God loves you. Just believe. It doesn't deal with their self-righteousness. Even though they lost everything, they'll be like, I've lost enough. You've lost enough. God loves you. Just believe. And you'll be saved. Making false converts. King Manasseh lost everything and he went directly to the Lord. He besought the Lord and humbled himself greatly. These people, well, I've lost everything. Easy believism, just believe. Of the church of the living God, you're going to hell. You're going to lose your soul in hell because you have sinned against the Lord. In someone's weakened state like that, they don't want to hear that. But they need to hear that. See, the easy believism comes in, speaking smooth words, prophesying the seeds. While we, the church of the living God, the more we love them, the less we are loved. And prayed unto him, and he was entreated of him, and heard his supplication, and brought him again to Jerusalem and to his, and into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. The worst of the worst, and I believe Manasseh is in heaven. The damage that he do, did against the Lord could not be undone. Okay, if you were to continue reading that, the people still did vilely according to what he did. Manasseh, he tried. It's like, look, I was wrong. But his damage that he did was already so profound, there was no going back from it. But he himself was made right with the Lord. Okay? Okay? Go to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. 
First Peter chapter 5, verses 6 on to verse 9. Hmm. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. When you lose everything, you haven't lost enough. You have to lose yourself. Come to the Lord on his terms, broken, contrite, and in fear of the Lord you call upon his name, and may he save you. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, walking to and fro, that's not in the text, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world, seeking whom he may devour, and whom better for the devil to devour those who have lost everything and to come in with a false gospel and another Jesus. It's good that in their weakened state that they're asking questions. But you preach to them the, the true gospel. You preach to them the true gospel. I know it might seem uncouth. It's like, I don't want to do that. They've been So what? They need to hear it. Because, look, there are millions of Christians out there. Millions. Billions even, probably. How many are of the church of God, the church of the living God, the ground and pillar of the truth? James chapter 4, verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Okay? Now, let's get to this Philippian jailer. Acts chapter 16. Uh, before we get to Acts chapter 16... The easy believism heretic, number one, does not deny that the Philippian jailer was broken. They don't deny that. But what they will deny, he had worldly sorrow, not godly sorrow. Because what does Paul say? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, thou in thine house. Doesn't mention anything of repentance. Why? Because he was already broken. Then the satanic, Jesuit, easy believism, devil scumbag comes in. Yea, hath God said, it's worldly sorrow that he had. Let's first look at that. Okay? We're going to be in Acts chapter 16, but go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 on to verse 11. Okay? Verses 8 on to verse 11 in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, the selfsame thing ye, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Now, they say, well, that's talking to church and living God, right? Yes, it is. But godly sorrow worketh what? Repentance to salvation. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. Okay? Repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Uh, go to Romans chapter 6. Okay? Romans chapter 6. All right? Romans chapter 6. Uh, what is that? 20 under verse 23. That's seven, Brad. Sorry about that. Romans 6, 20 under verse 23. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. The things that you are ashamed of. Worldly things. Okay? 
But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Those poor people who launched themselves out of the windows of the Trade Center, or not the Trade Center, of the Empire State Building when the, uh, during the Great Depression, that was worldly sorrow. Now, let's go to Acts chapter 16. Let's read about the Philippian jailer. Okay. Did the Philippian jailer kill himself? Paul stopped him. Yes, but we just read that worldly sorrow uh, leads to death. And the wages of sin is death. The Philippian jailer had godly sorrow. Not worldly sorrow. Because if he a genius, if he had worldly sorrow, he would have succeeded and Paul and them wouldn't have said anything. Acts chapter 16. Verses 25 on to verse 34. And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's hand, bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled. Why was he going to kill himself? Because they were going to kill him. Yes, but note that they sang praises to God in verse 25. So the witness of God was already there, and the Philippian jailer heard it. Okay, And then all this happened, and he was about to kill himself. And then, but Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. So, if it were worldly sorrow, he would have succeeded. He would have succeeded. But in that broken state, he hearing, okay, before this, in verse 25, at, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Oh, well, it doesn't say... If the prisoners heard them, you can infer that the jailer heard them as well. You, you heretics will do anything to save your satanic little gospel. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must, what must I do to be saved? Saved. Doesn't say that it said, what must I do to save my life? What must I do to be saved? He heard the testimony of God through them praying and singing hymns. Okay? The doors opened all of a sudden. He was about to kill himself. He was going to go to hell. Paul's like, whoa, wait a minute. The worldly sorrow ceased. Godly sorrow. What must I do to be saved? He had godly sorrow. Okay? He could have saved his life by running. Couldn't he have? Yes, he could have. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Now, if he had worldly sorrow that worketh to death, he would eventually die. You don't read it. Of course, he died eventually. It was thousands of years ago. But the Philippian jailer never committed suicide. He never died. Yes, he died eventually, yes. But see, your argument that it was worldly, no. The Philippian jailer had godly sorrow. This, unlike what we will probably see in a generation, in a society that has been taught against God, okay? Unlike the Philippian jailer, what we are going to see today are those who are going to be only having worldly sorrow. Unlike the Philippian jailer who heard the praises of God, saw the miracle of the, everything opening at the same time, going to kill himself, but Paul's like, hey, wait. Then he's like, what must I do to be saved? He could have ran. He could have gotten out of there. 
No one probably would have found him. He had godly sorrow. What we are going to be in, uh, in, uh, encountering, brethren, are people who will not have godly sorrow, but have sorrow, worldly sorrow, where we need to preach unto them the true gospel to show them, hey, yes, you lost everything. You're close to losing your soul. Because when they come in, when the devil comes in with the easy beliefs, easy beliefs, believism, heresy, blah, I'll spit it out, okay? They're going to be going to Satan. They're going to be preaching another gospel, another Jesus. Making them false converts. And then Satan's going to come along with, you know, everybody, love everybody, the ecumenicals thing. Hey, why Christians are, Catholics are Christians, right? It's going to begin even so more so the sowing seeds of the beginning one world religion, which will end up in Catholicism. Okay? We need to be aware of this. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. Guy was already broken. Spoke unto him the word of the Lord. Hey, you're not good. You were about to kill yourself. But you know that you're not a good person? There's none righteous, no, not one. Okay? See, even if he did, which he did, but even if he did, they preached unto him the Lord Jesus Christ, the true gospel. Even if he did have worldly sorrow, which he did not, because if he did, he would have succeeded. But he didn't, because he had godly sorrow. He became a true convert. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straight way. What are we reading to? Verse 34. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. The Philippian jailer had godly sorrow. If he had worldly sorrow, he would have died. Very simple. And he didn't. Okay? Now, you want to see an example of the easy believism heretic gospel? Acts chapter 8. And we've covered this before, but we're going to cover it again. Okay? We're going to cover it again. Acts chapter 8, verses 9, under verse 24. But there was a certain man called Shimon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. Okay? Now this guy's heart was hard already. And the easy believism comes to, uh, heretics comes to this and says this guy was saved because he believed. They have to in order to uh, perpetuate their satanic gospel. But he wasn't saved at all, okay? To whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying this man is the great power of God. So he had a big head, okay? Like some people, you know, some uh, King James Bible believing Christians. And to him they had regard, because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men, both men and women. Then Shimon himself believed also, and he was baptized even. He continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Shimon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given. He offered them money. Because he was the great one, but then he was dethroned. Now he wants to see an opportunity to become a great one again by laying on of hands. See, he was thinking of his own rear end. It's like, well, at least I'll be in heaven. Uh, you're not thinking of the honor of our Lord. You're not truly saved. I don't believe you are saved if you have that mentality. Well, at least I'm going to be in heaven. Even though I live like, I don't believe you're saved. Is it possible such a one could be saved? We have just seen today that yes, there are going to be those in heaven who the Lord is going to be ashamed of. 
We've, we've seen the proof, proof of it. We have. God forbid any one of you who hear this be that. But I more reckon that they're not safe to begin with. We'll find out, won't we, buddy? Saying, give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. See, it was all about exalting himself, not the Lord. Hence, you, I live like the devil, but hey, I'm going to heaven when I die. But you've cast shame upon the name of the Lord, and you have shamed him, and he's ashamed of you, and at least you're going to heaven? Yeah, you might be going to heaven, but like we've already seen, go away from me. I don't even want to look at you. And that's good enough for you? You're disgusting. You're disgusting. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. He wasn't saved. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness, and in the bond of iniquity. Bitter, because he lost his position. Proof that he wasn't saved? Absolutely right here. Manasseh sought the Lord. Manasseh, the worst of the worst. Manasseh, and Manasseh is in heaven. In a different dispensation even. This Shimon. Then answered Shimon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. Then it is rumored that this Shimon guy was one of the fathers of Gnosticism. Gnosticism. Okay. That flesh, that flesh became God, not God became flesh. I believe, brethren, like I said, we're going to be encountering many people who have lost everything, but we got to make sure that they're hearing the right gospel because you watch these scumbag, easy believism devils are going to come right in and make false converts of them. we got to remember Romans chapter 12, verses 1 on to verse 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. But yet you're living like a devil, and you're saved. I don't believe you're saved. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What are you proving to your so-called Christians that follow you? That it's okay to slander and that it's okay that all to do is you make attack videos. You're proving to these people that evil is good if it's done in the name of the Lord. That's what you're proving to people. You're lost. You're not saved. Okay? Also, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We have to remember this, brethren. Because it's not going to be well received when people are suffering, when we come uh, with the gospel of brokenness, contrition, and fear of the Lord. Someone in that position is going to be ready to receive, God loves you, just believe, rather than you need to repent of your self-righteousness. You're going to hell unless you repent of yourself and have fear of the Lord. It's your fault that God died on the cross. They're not going to want to hear that, but they need to hear it. Okay? you got to remember 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 5 on to verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Or was it 2 Corinthians chapter 4? Yes. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness... And will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. It takes time to discern whether these people are truly saved or false converts. There is no rapido um, 
litmus test. There isn't. Some are obvious, some are not. It takes time, and they always shoot themselves in the foot over time. And these things, brethren, have I f have, and these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? I just believe, therefore I am saved. By grace for faith? Or just because you believed? Hmm. Now ye are full. Now ye are rich. Ye have reigned as kings without us. I would to God ye did reign, that we might that we also might reign with you. Truth of the matter here. For I think God has set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. The easy believism gospel the world doesn't want to reject. Especially when they start being losing things. How sweet and how soothing, how smooth to come along a guy with a big smile. <laughs> Just believe. Just believe. You don't know. Repentance is going from unbelief to belief. Prayer is a work. Calling on the name of the Lord was for the Jews. Just believe. Really? When a lot of the atheists that I've encountered have more sense than that. But when you get them where they've lost everything, right pickings. And I'm going to submit to you that the devil has allowed it to do it that way so he can make so many false converts. Great falling away, remember? We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place and labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we blessed. Being persecuted, we suffer. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscoring of all things unto this day. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons. I warn you. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 on to verse 13. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, and patience. You know in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable thing of God? Okay? Who are you proving it to? To them. To them. Persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly, separate other, in Christ Jesus, shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall, wa or shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. God loves you, just believe. God appeared to me. I saw it. Second Timothy chapter 2, verses 1, under verse 5. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. We have to be diligent. We have to be vigilant, brethren, in these times. We're going to be losing. We're all going to be losing things. But we need to be vigilant. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. That doesn't mean that you don't work. That doesn't mean that kind of stuff. 
It means that you don't get entangled with the petty stuff. Television, movies, video games, entertainment, you know. Arguments about what color Jesus Christ's eyes were. Stuff like that, okay? And if any man, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. And you strive lawfully by striving according to the scriptures, not booting the door out of the way and climbing up some other way. Okay? Because, and with that in, in mind, you know, you we read in here, and it is 2 uh, Timothy chapter 3, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Lovers of their own selves, covetous. They lost everything. And here shoo, comes easy believism. What are we to do? Verses 1 and verse 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Long suffering for lost people. Patience for the saved. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And again, when the, their loved ones start dying and they lose stuff because the price uh, cost of living is through the roof and quality of living is down the toilet. Fables. They want to hear God loves them. God's not mad at you. God, Everybody's going to be safe. Just believe. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned on to fables. Verse 5, But watch thou in all things, brethren, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Ministry. We are all in the ministry of reconciliation. Now on to, on to Timothy, you know, minister, being a preacher and stuff like that. But we're all in the ministry of reconciliation you are not exempt. Evangelize. Because at their weakest point, they need to hear the true gospel. Because when these people reach their weakest point, coming in here in the next couple of years, I believe, these easy believers and heretics, they're already through the roof. Oh, yeah. First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3. Verses 4. Uh, what is that, 15 on to verse 16? But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you the reason of things. No, the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. See, these, these Calvinist type guys will come to this, verse 15, and this is where they have this thing called apologetics. I hate that. We don't apologize for the gospel. Okay? But apologetics is to answer every question of the atheist. Brethren, there are those out there who ask foolish questions, who don't want to hear the truth, but just ask questions to begin strife and debate. Okay? You can spot. These guys are actually, the longer you go, become quite easier to spot. Okay? But... There are those out there who will ask questions, who want nothing to do with truth, like I said, who just want to continue their narrative of argument. Those get away from. But any man, to every man, the reason of the hope, which we do not see because we walk by faith, not by sight. And if the Lord has appeared to you, guess what? God is a respecter of persons and you're not walking by faith. You're walking because you saw the Lord. You lying hypocrite. Having a good conscience. 
that whereof, whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Again, who are you proving it onto? Onto yourself or onto them? Okay? In Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. Verses 10 on to verse 14. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth the man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth the man. <laughs> then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? And the Pharisees were covetous. They elevated their tradition above Scripture. Oh, like the, tra the tradition of Christ, Mass, above Scripture. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. When you come to them with the true gospel, and they reject it, even in their broken state, a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is, does one does such is subverted and sinneth within himself. It's not up for us to beat them over the head with the gospel. It is up to us to present to them the true gospel. Because there are going to be two gospels and two Christs preached when this stuff happens. The Christ of that man of sin, the son of perdition, that antichrist, and the Christ of the Scriptures. We are to preach the Christ of the Scriptures. But if they're not going to hear it, after the first and second admonition, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Because that easy believism gospel, brethren, is going to sound so appealing. And it is appealing to the skin suit, but not to the truth. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 under verse 15. Dispensationally, he was talking about, the, we're going to see that. This was written before the death, burial, and resurrection. But our instruction in righteousness. If one doesn't want to hear you, go on to the next. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not in the way of the Gentiles, and into any of the city of the Samaritans enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Greek is a Gentile, okay? This was before the death, burial, and resurrection, when Jesus was offering the kingdom of heaven unto the Jews, okay? And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Kingdom of heaven, the thousand-year reign of our Lord Jesus Christ. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely ye give, because the Jews require a sign. Provide neither gold nor, all, nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor scrip, thank you, brother, for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes nor yet staffs, for the workman is worthy of his meat. And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till ye go thence. And when ye come into an house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Okay, you were warned. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for that land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Better is it for some of you not to hear than to reject, to knowingly that you're going to hell because you rejected the gospel. Such will be the case for everybody. Who is in hell? There isn't one innocent. There ain't one person, innocent person in hell, people. Remember that. Okay? 
And also, Luke 10. We're almost done. Luke 10, verses 12 on the verse 10. Uh, 10 on the verse 12. Luke 10, 10 on the 12. But into whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you not, go your ways out into the streets of the same, and say, Even the very dust of your city which cleaveth on us, we do wipe off against you. Notwithstanding, be sure of this, that the kingdom of God is come, on, come nigh unto you. And it is nigh unto everybody, as it says in Romans chapter 10. But not at gunpoint. Okay? And also you see this in Acts. Now the shaking off the visible thing was like where they shake their raiment was for the Jews. But the point is, if someone you first and second admonition, if they don't want to hear it, you've given your witness, you've planted that seed. If they don't want to hear it, that's on them. Go to the next one. Because brethren, when the economy starts to collapse, when people start dying, there's good. Yes! Yes! The field is going to be ripe! If you, you want, really want to be sick and twisted and call that prosperity, you're nuts in your head. But when these bad things start happening, the, the field is going to be ripe. And what's more, Satan knows that. All we are to do is be witnesses unto our Lord and preach the true gospel. Well, these easy believers and heretics are going to be preaching another gospel and another Jesus. Okay? Preach to them true repentance. Not a uh, godly sorrow. Not worldly sorrow. Not worldly sorrow. Because these people are going to have worldly sorrow and hence they have worldly sorrow. In comes Satan. Easy believers and God loves you. Just believe. We. You're going to hell. You're going to hell. It's your fault that Christ died. It's your fault. You're a sinner. You need to repent of your self-righteousness. God has every right to send you to hell, and that's where you're going unless you repent of your self-righteousness and go to the Lord and call upon his name. It's your fault. This is your fault. You chose against him. Who wants to hear that at their worst part, right? Right? Acts chapter 13, and then we'll be done. Verses 44 on to verse 52. And the next Sabbath day, Acts chapter 13, this dispensation, and the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing ye put it, ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. That's not Calvinism. Okay? Ordained to eternal life. You're ordained to eternal life when you come to the Lord on His terms. The way of the cross. Don't boot the door out of the way. Christ is the door and climb up some other way. You wicked heretic. Okay? And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. But the Jews stood up to devout and honorable women. Women. And the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came in unto Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. The shaking the dust off your feet. If they're not going to hear you, if they're not going to listen, after the first and second admonition, some will argue, well, that's someone who's messed up, whatever. Give him two chances. I was given a plentitude of chances till the Lord saved me.
Brethren, these people in these times coming are going to be sorry that they have lost everything and they're going to have worldly sorrow. That, yes, they're going to be susceptible to hear the true gospel, but we have to be on guard because the enemy is going to sweep in with the fake and we need to be there with the real. Okay? Mind your P's and Q's. Walk your life according to the scriptures. Get out of your house those things that are opening doorways for devils. Repent! And live your life according to the scripture so you may prove unto the lost what is good and acceptable, perfect will of God. Okay? Because just like the criminal who has repentance because he was caught, but not because of the act that he did unto the individual, we're going to be running into a lot of that and we need to be prepared for it. And we, uh, we've looked, we've seen already. There's going to be a lot of people like Pharaoh who's going to have repentance when they're brought to the bitter end. But then, because of a hardened heart, they're going to repent of that repentance and be as a dog that returns to their vomit. And go back to their old way. Hence, they were never saved. Just like what we started out with in this video. Just like what we started out with in Matthew chapter 13. In Matthew chapter 13, Verses 20 on to verse 21. With all the stuff that's going to be coming upon us. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon, by and by, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he no root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. What do you mean I can't live like that anymore? I got it. What? I, no, I just believe. I can do whatever I want because his grace covers everything. You see? Just because someone is brought to an end of themselves doesn't mean they are broken of their self-righteousness. We're going to see many people, just like in the Great Depression, you know, like, look that up sometime. Guys, pew, launching themselves out of windows. Worldly sorrow. And they're in hell because of it. We're going to see that again. And we, the Church of the Living God, we need to be there as His ambassadors. Let's be there. Okay? Get out there. Quit with your excuses and get out there. Okay? That is going to be it for this video, brethren. I hope this has helped. I, 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 hope, this, I hope this comes as a good warning to you. We need to be prepared for this. Okay? You need to be prepared. We can't be sitting there... Oh, what hit us while everybody's arguing about Christmas? <laughs> I'm lost because I speak against Christmas. No, you're lost because you're an idolater. Give me a break. We don't got time for this. You don't even know what liberty is. You don't even know what charity is. Give me a break. coming brethren we need to be prepared we're going to meet many people we're going to be broken because they've lost everything but not broken of their self-righteousness and you watch they're going to be as criminals who are sorry when they are caught and when they see receive some respite they're going to be like a pharaoh and turn and rend you and be as a dog that returns to their vomit we need to be aware of that because who knows within that multitude Maybe a scarce few may truly get saved and come to the true Lord Jesus Christ by hearing the true gospel. Okay? So, let this be a warning unto you. Let's go. Let's do this. Okay? Anyway, we love you. Thank you so much for watching this if you do. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your help. Thank you. Without you, without the Lord through you, we wouldn't. <laughs> As it was made known to me this Tuesday,
Having a heart condition, it's not fun. But praise the Lord for it. But enough of that. Got to get this video uploaded. We love you. And we'll see you in the next video.